The UN's nuclear agency says Iran has pledged to cooperate with the monitoring of its sites. That comes after a visit by the head of the agency to Tehran. Could this lead to a new nuclear agreement? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog says Iran has agreed to reinstall monitoring equipment at one of its main nuclear plants. It's a big development since talks to restart cooperation have been stalled since 2021. Rafael Grossi visited Tehran after the International Atomic Energy Agency reported particles of uranium had been enriched to near weapons-grade level at the Fordow nuclear facility. That level is seen as significant because a larger stockpile of higher-grade uranium would cut down the time it would take to make a nuclear bomb. Tehran denies wanting to develop a nuclear weapon, but it has ramped up its enrichment program since former President Donald Trump withdrew the United States from the deal in 2018. During his trip, Grossi met President Ibrahim Raisi. He also held talks with senior officials of Iran's Atomic Energy Organization on increasing cooperation at three sites. The meetings helped confirm that high-level enriched uranium was not being produced for accumulated or accumulated at the Fordow nuclear facility. Grossi returned to Vienna on Saturday and had this to say. There was a detection of uh, a certain level and then we uh, asked for clarification. But what we have seen in our continuous, uh, continued um, observation of the facility is that there has not been production or accumulation of uranium at that uh, level, which is a very high level, of course. 60 is already very high, but as I said, we have um, we, ways and means to inspect it. Iran has pledged to cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency at a number of nuclear sites and to reinstall monitoring equipment removed in 2021. Enriched uranium can be used in civil nuclear power generators as well as nuclear weapons. However, the threshold for weapons-grade uranium is extremely high. That has to be enriched by 90 percent to be effective, whereas nuclear power generators need up to 2 percent. After the U.S. left the 2015 nuclear deal under Donald Trump, Iran hasn't abided by an agreement to enrich to a maximum of 3.67 percent. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. Joining me in Tehran is Fuad Izadi, associate professor at the, facu the Faculty of World Studies at the University of Tehran. In Las Vegas is Sahil Shah, nuclear policy specialist and senior Iran policy advisor at the European Leadership Network. And in Washington, D.C. is Alex Fatanka, director and senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and founding director of its Iran program. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Sahil, let me start with you today. The U.N. nuclear watchdog chief said he had constructive meetings with Iranian officials in Tehran. First of all, how big a breakthrough was this visit, and do you believe that a positive outcome uh, will be achieved because of it? Thank you so much for, for having me this morning. Um, I think it definitely is on the cusp of a breakthrough, but we need to see what Iran's follow-on actions are. As you can see from the joint statement that was released between the IAEA and Iran, it's very vague, and the Director General Rafael Grossi was only able to elaborate a little bit in terms of what concrete actions Iran will be taking, both to clarify past activities, but to also increase transparency on its current nuclear activities. I definitely think that this is a reset in some regards of the political relationship between the IAEA and Iran. Um, for a very long time, uh, there was a stalemate between the agency and Iran because Iran felt it was being treated unfairly and the agency felt like Iran wasn't giving technically credible answers um, to it on a variety of issues. So I think it's a good moment. I think it's going to help build confidence, but we still need to see um, where this uh, new agreement and roadmap for future relations leads to. Uh, Fuad, how significant was this visit for the Iranian government, and, and how was the visit being viewed in Iran? You know, uh, the uh, board meeting of uh, International Atomic Energy Agency is going to be tomorrow. Uh, so by inviting Mr. Grossi, Iranian government, I think, 
wanted to make sure that uh, the visit is a positive one. Uh, the statements that uh, Mr. Grossi made in Tehran and in Vienna when he returned to uh, his uh, uh, office was uh, quite positive. Um, and this is what Iran wanted to make sure. Uh, you know, there are difficulties in Iran-U.S. Uh, relations and Iran-European relations have faced difficulties as well. Uh, Iran is interested in the nuclear agreement. Uh, there are a number of obstacles. One obstacle uh, is Iran's relations with IAEA. So the hope in Tehran is to resolve uh, the difficulties between Iran and IAEA and make sure at least one portfolio is closed uh, and then we can move on to other issues mm. and hopefully the nuclear agreement can uh, be reinstated again. Uh, Alex, as you heard there from uh, Fuad, obviously uh, the relationship between uh, Iran and the U.S. is, is you know, is, is a quite difficult relationship, uh, a lot of obstacles there. Um, do we know what the Biden administration uh, perceives of this meeting that happened, of this visit by Rafael Grossi? Uh, what must they be thinking? Look, I, I haven't seen any immediate reactions post uh, Rafael Gross's uh, return to Vienna. It remains to be seen. I'm sure there'll be uh, uh, reports to that effect next week. But in terms of what I heard Robert Mali, the Iran envoy, say last week in Washington is there's always hope. Uh, diplomacy is the first choice for the Biden administration. They've kept all the other options on the table. That They're really hoping that this diplomatic set of talks will continue. But it's a, it's a hope that, um, that shouldn't be exaggerated. Remember, uh, uh, Grossi has, this I believe is his fourth visit to Iran since 2021, early 2021, when uh, uh, Ibrahim Raisi took over, uh, I'm sorry, in, in late 21, when he took over as president. This is his fourth visit. And each time we've been hopeful that something new will happen. And then the politics of this is so complicated. So it's really not just about the number of centrifuges and how much they enrich. As we all know by now, it's it's complicated. It's in it, you know it's about the political uh, standoff essentially between Washington and Tehran, and I don't see the Iranian side making any moves on that issue. Uh, Sahil, um, do you believe that we're any closer now, um, where there could potentially be constructive steps taken to try and return to the Iran nuclear deal, or at least get negotiations back on track to try to return to the nuclear deal? While the outcomes of the director general's visit are definitely positive from a nuclear transparency perspective, I can't say that it's going to greatly change the atmospherics between the U.S. and Iran, between Europeans and Iran. You know, as you know, um, things have become quite complicated since the fall when we really had a great moment of opportunity to reseal the return to the JCPO. J JCPOA. Um, but since then, the increase in suppression of protesters in Iran, Iran's supply of arms to Russia, these two things have really complicated the situation. And what the director general has done is essentially try to help create some breathing room so that the agency is able to have a more accurate assessment of a baseline of where Iran's nuclear program stands. And that will obviously be really helpful if there is an opportunity to restore the JCPOA so that all the countries involved know where Iran has to start in terms of rolling back its nuclear program to the uh, original restrictions that had been agreed under the terms of that deal. So I can't say that this is going to change anything for the prospects for the JCPOA, but it will certainly make it easier if there is that moment of opportunity that comes up in the coming months. But there is a lot greater political obstacles in the way of that happening. Alex, you spoke before about the difficulties uh, that are inherent in, in trying to put forth a roadmap to return to negotiations when it comes to the U.S. and when it comes to, to Iran, especially there being a lack of trust on, on both sides when it comes to any type of negotiation going forward. Um, what does the U.S. want to see from Iran in order to move forward? I, I ask this because you, you, know, you mentioned Robert Malley earlier, and, and one of the things that we heard from Robert Malley over the course of the last few months is, is there was a sense that in the Biden administration, um, they didn't really want to move forward when it came to the nuclear issue um, because of what was going on when it came to the protests in Iran. Right. No, I think that's definitely a factor. I mean, uh, Sahil just made the, the two points I would have made. Uh, Iran's decision to start uh, giving drones and military support to Russia makes no sense 
uh, if you believe that the Iranians really wanted to find a solution to this. I mean, it's not that Iran is making billions of dollars from selling these drones to the Russians. So you have to ask the question, if they were serious about a nuclear deal, they would have at least told Vladimir Putin, yeah, we, we, we might support you, but we're not going to you know, jeopardize our nuclear talks with the West, which is exactly what Iran has done. And on top of that, the Iranian regime over the course of the last seven uh, months has, by international reports, killed about 530 of its own citizens, protesters, and detained about 20,000. It's extremely hard for any Western government to want to sit down and cut a new big, shiny diplomatic deal with an Islamic Republic that it's doing what it's doing to its own people. So yes, the optics of this are important. President Biden uh, didn't even mention Iran in his State of the Union speech. It should have been something he would perhaps flag as an important uh, mission that it's on, but he knows how politically difficult this uh, pathway is. Iran and the United States, as we all know, have had a thorny relationship going back to 1979. And again, I want to just put one more point on this. If you listen to the Iranians right now in terms of some of the hardliners, they're looking at Gross's visits as a gathering information and handed it all over to the Israelis. So they're not even, to my mind, still very serious about using Gross's visit as a moment, perhaps, where they can turn the page and start something different, different going forward. Uh, Fouad, it looked to me like you might have wanted to respond to uh, what Alex was saying there. I, I will let you do that, but I also want to ask you, I, I had asked Alex what the U.S. wants to see from Iran in order to move forward. I also want to ask you, what does Iran want to see the U.S. do in order to move forward? You know, the Biden administration could return to the agreement on the first day of the Biden presidency in the U.S. government, uh, executive orders that are issued by a president could be nullified by the next president. Uh, Trump left the agreement illegally, unjustly, without any justification, while Iran was fully following the agreement through an executive order. Biden could uh, uh, cancel that executive order the same way he did that with uh, the Paris Climate Accords. So it is possible, it was possible for him to do it. And he could give uh, two or three months to, for, to Iran to return uh, to the place that Iran was uh, before Trump left the agreement. The reason uh, Biden did not return was because of the hysteria that you just experienced a few minutes ago. There is this anti-Iran force uh, in Washington they didn't like the agreement to start with. Uh, the people who actually supported the agreement didn't like the government. They thought uh, of the agreement uh, as a way of uh, overthrowing the Iranian government. And they're looking for excuses to not do what the international law says. You know, the Iran nuclear agreement is uh, UN Resolution 2231. So if you violate the agreement, you are violating international law. You are violating UN resolutions. So they come up with excuses, uh, baseless claims and exaggerated numbers uh, about the number of people who have uh, passed away in Iran, uh, exaggerated uh, content about Iran's foreign policy. If somebody in Washington or in London or in Paris or somewhere else in Europe is concerned about Iran selling drones to Russia, maybe they could offer a higher price. Uh, these countries that uh, questions, uh, question Iran's uh, you know, defense policies are, are major arms suppliers. They sell billions of dollars of uh, worth of weapons uh, every year. They are in no position to question uh, Iran's defense policy or foreign policy. Uh, they can, they can do that, but I don't think they will get very far with that type of policy. Mm. The, the failed policies of Trump is going to be followed by Biden. I think both of them are mistaken. Uh, Alex, it looks like you want to jump in. I, first, I want to go to Sahil. I have a question for him. Uh, Sahil, Rafael Grossi, uh, after this visit, said that it had been agreed that monitoring activities would be operating again, but he didn't really provide details about which equipment would be restored or how exactly that would happen. So is it possible to discern what he was referring to, or is it just wait and see at this point? So I definitely will caveat this by saying that it is wait and see for now, because we want to really get to the bottom of um, 
what can be possible based on the technical decisions that the agency and Iran will have over the next few days and weeks. But from the press conference, we can ascertain that there is going to be an increased inspection effort in general, that there will be more visibility into facilities. I think one of the specific things that he mentioned was turning back cameras on uh, that had been turned off um, in recent months. Um, and that's really important from a continu continuity of knowledge perspective so that we can reassemble um, some level of a baseline of where Iran is at. However, of course, there's still a nine-month gap. So one outstanding question is, is Iran going to hand over that footage? Um, so with the cameras, we still don't have a full picture. Another thing that the director general mentioned is the online enrichment monitoring uh, mechanism. So under the JCPOA, there was about 130 to 150 inspectors authorized to go into Iran at all times. The inspectors were present at all the key Iranian sites on a near da daily basis, including Natanz. Fordo and others, and that was even from before implementation day. And this was one of the strengths of the deal and the reason why our confidence was exceptionally high in the IAEA's information as a result when the JCPOA was in place. And the data that is collected by instruments like the online enrichment monitoring systems is mostly stored on site and it can't be transmitted off site or out of the country. And that's not unique to Iran, but it's the case in a lot of countries where the IAEA works because people are obviously worried about data security. So these online enrichment monitors, OLEMs, are online in the sense that they are measuring enrichment levels in real time for the gas flowing through the pipes in the facilities. And this is important because obviously it's been spread around the world through the news that Iran was enriching up to 84 percent. And obviously the director general has clarified with Iran that Iran is not producing uh, enriched uranium at that level or accumulating any enriched uranium at that level. But things like turning back these OLEM devices back on would indeed help make sure that this continues to be the case and that the IAEA has any uh, relevant knowledge that's needed if there are any oscillations in the levels of enrichment, whether it's done intentionally or not. The role of the agency is not to determine what Iran's intentions are. They are to track everything that is happening with the nuclear material in the country and to report that to the member states to then make any kind of value judgments. So I think so far, from what he's mentioned, the cameras and the online enrichment monitoring systems, these are really important. And if he manages to get Iran to turn them back on, it will indeed be a very positive thing from a verification and monitoring perspective. Uh, Alex, uh, you wanted to jump in before, so I'm going to let you. I also want to ask you, uh, from your perspective, um, will there be additional sanctions uh, against Iran? And, and do you believe that sanctions against Iran have worked up until this point? I mean, very quickly, uh, uh, your guest in Tehran, uh, I think it was um, myself referring to hysteria. And, and, you know, I don't think it's it's me being hysterical here. I think I'm just reflecting better. And that's ironic because I'm sitting 7,000 miles away in Washington, and I believe I have a better sense of what's going on in Iran right now than your guest who refuses to accept that these people who are being killed in the protest movement are not passing away, they're being killed by the security forces of the Islamic Republic. So, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, of just keeping this conversation real, let's accept some um, some hard facts. And the other hard fact I would say, it's not just me saying that Iran's foreign policy right now is at a critical juncture. Many, many officials in the Islamic Republic, if you watch Iranian TV and you read their uh, news uh, papers, they accept that they don't know where they're going. They don't know if they should trust Russia. They don't know if they should trust the Chinese. Uh, so I, I think there's a, this is a much bigger issue than what I just said. In terms of uh, your question of specifically on sanctions, look, Iran today is the second most sanctioned country on earth. Uh, Russia just overtook it because of its illegal invasion of Ukraine a year ago, uh, which country like Iran that was illegally attacked by Saddam Hussein should have been first to condemn, but the, Iranians, uh, the Iranian regime hasn't done so. But my point is this, sanctions Sanctions are not going to bring the Islamic Republic down. That is that has probably been true for many years now. The question is, if you want to proceed down the path of sanctions, what kind of sanctions you focus on? And I think right now the Biden administration is leaning on sanctioning individuals with blood on their hands, folks in the Iranian regime who are actually responsible for arrest, killing, and so forth. And I think that is going to get a the Biden uh, team a lot of uh, you know support here politically in the United States. 
Uh, and I think that obviously the Iranian opposition would welcome it. But the question, and again, is it enough to bring the Islamic Republic down? Not in the short term. The short term, the Iranian regime has learned to be resilient when it comes to sanctions. They're paying a very high price for being sanctioned, a very high price. They're really, uh, you know, you, the Iranian economy is nose diving. Uh, but they're not going to, these sanctions are not, are, alone are not going to bring the regime down, uh, not in my estimation at least. Uh, Fouad, uh, Iran, of course, denies wanting to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, they've said that on many occasions. Um, what was Iran's response when asked why uranium particles enriched up to 83.7 percent had been detected at the Fordow plant? You know, this was actually covered uh, with uh, Mr. Grossi, both in Tehran and in Vienna. He talked about uh, that 83 uh, percent issue, and he clarified the fact that uh, this was not something that was, Iran was doing in terms of making enriched uranium, stockpiling 83 percent enriched uranium. This is what happens when you are uh, doing 60 percent or 30 percent or other percentage of enriched uranium. Sometimes it jumps, jumps over what you are doing and it comes back. So uh, I, I, uh, you can go back to what Mr. Gorosi said on that. And also I encourage you to uh, listen to uh, William Burns who is the head of the CIA. He had an interview with uh, CBS News, uh, and he uh, very clearly said that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, and Iran uh, it has not decided to make one. Uh, and uh, no matter what people in Washington say, the demonization of uh, Iran is not really working out, we actually should thank uh, Washington think tankers, because with the inaccurate uh, information that they provide, they actually help the Iranian government to continue. One of the reasons uh, all the sanctions against Iran has not uh, worked is because of this type of analysis, because they don't know what's going on in Tehran. They give wrong analysis, and that's actually helping the Iranian government, uh, because the accuracy that uh, is required is not there. Uh, and that's why you have failed policies in Washington, and that is why you have the Islamic Republic celebrating the 44th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. Fouad, let me follow up with you and just ask you um, uh, about one of the expected results of this trip by Mr. Grossi is that Iran is supposed to provide access to information, to people, and to locations. Um, do you think that that is going to happen quickly? What is what's the kind of timeline we're looking at when it comes to granting the kind of access that the IAEA would like to see? You know, the, what Mr. Grossi said was that a technical team will be in Tehran shortly. This is, I, I don't know the exact time that they're coming, but I think they will be in uh, Tehran soon. Uh, and uh, the level of Iran cooperation with IAEA will have a political component. So if uh, Iranian officials uh, realize that Washington is ready to return to the nuclear agreement, they will uh, cooperate with IAEA more. If they realize that uh, people like Robert Menendez, the head of uh, the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, who's opposed, has opposed the nuclear agreement for many years, his policies and his uh, rhetoric is in place in Washington, then Iran's cooperation would be less. We have this infighting in Washington between different centers of power, even within the Biden administration, the disagreements. And this is the reason Washington has left the table. But they cannot say this, so they blame Ukraine. They b come up with other uh, you know, strange numbers about what's going on in Iran. Uh, but the real problem is that. So whenever Washington decides to clean up house and, and make sure that uh, the policies are uh, helping both sides, then you can see results. But if they continue the failed policies of the past, I don't think Iran's cooperation would be at the level that uh, Mr. Gorosi expects. Sahil, uh, the one thing that is clear out of all of this is that this is a very, very complicated issue. What are some concrete steps that need to be taken in order to get things back on track so that negotiations can happen and that, and that perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, the, the, the nuclear deal can be entered into again? I mean, are there specific concrete steps that can be taken right away in order to try to get this going? I think there has to be an improvement in the political uh, relationships with the players involved and also in the general atmospherics, which 
are not being helped by, by Iran's actions at home and also in terms of its supply of weapons to Russia. Obviously, Ukraine is at the top of the agenda for the United States and for European allies. And sitting, uh, you know, even at a table for Europeans uh, with Iranians on the JCPOA at the moment makes no sense to them. Um, and it doesn't seem really possible also for the Biden administration to clear any domestic political hurdles to get any kind of deal pushed forward in a meaningful way either. So I think at the moment, really, what we need is everybody to to try to establish some level of awareness of what all the sides' red lines are, to work on crisis management and keeping communication lines open so that we don't accidentally or intentionally blunder into a war. And I think that we need to really keep our uh, eyes on the prize and maintain a good level of information out of Iran so that we have an understanding of current activities so that mm. um, hawks Washington and hawks elsewhere aren't able to manipulate information. You know, Iran should see it in its own so, interest to be transparent. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're just running out of time, and I want to get one last question here to uh, Alex. Alex, you heard Sahil there talking about that there needs to be a, an awareness of red lines going forward, uh, and the communication lines need to remain open between these countries. We only have about a minute and a half left. So let me ask you quickly. Is that the case? Is there an awareness of these red lines and are communication lines actually open right now? No, I think, yeah, obviously, there are ways for the two sides to communicate, including uh, third party countries like uh, Qatar, Oman, uh, and others have, have been involved in sort of mediating to the extent that they can. Uh, so that that's happening. I mean, Iran and uh, United States can find ways to communicate. And that's important that that you know exists. Uh, in terms of red lines, look, we can sit here and spend the rest of the day talking about num centrifuges and enrichment levels and so forth. End of the day, uh, uh, I think, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, with its head Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, they are not ready to have a deeper dialogue with, with the United States because they think that deeper dialogue is essentially going to lead to the downfall of the Islamic Republic. And again, don't take my word for it. This is all published in various languages, in Farsi, in English, mm. on the website of Ali Khamenei. He says mm. that the Americans are after concessions. They want one concession after another. With that sort of mentality, it's really hard for me to see how diplomatic uh, breakthrough is possible. Mm. Because even if you end up with another nuclear deal, it's just a question of time before that will collapse. And we can blame Trump and others, but it's not about individuals. Mm -hmm. It's about the ideology right now that mm -hmm. needs to change, certainly, I think. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Fuad Izadi, Sahil Shah, and Alex Fatanka. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.